All right. Well, hello, everybody. Sorry. Hello. Sorry. Can you mute yourselves, please? Thanks. Okay. Mute. Okay. Hi, everybody, and Happy New Year. The last year, as I, I, everybody I've spoken to has said, last year was tough. So this webinar has been formulated to encourage you to leave the year behind and to enter the new year with creativity and confidence in yourself. So before we launch into your questions, um, let's start by giving you five quick tips from established writers. Okay, these are writers of the order of, to begin with, Louis L'Amour, um, everyone's beloved cowboy writer. He said, start writing no matter what. The water doesn't flow until the faucet is turned on. And the next one is from William Faulkner, a different kind of writer. He said, you don't start out um, uh, oh, sorry, no, he said, get it down, take chances. It may be bad, but it's the only way you can do anything really good. And then Octavia Butler, who is, I believe, I haven't read her work, but she's a science fiction writer of extraordinary talent. She said, you don't start out writing good stuff. You start out writing crap and thinking it's good stuff. And then gradually you get better at it. And then Jodie Picot, who said, you can always edit a bad page. You can't edit a blank page. And finally, Jack London said, you can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. <laughs> That's a manly thing to say. Yes. <laughs> okay, so on to the questions. Um, Dricus Pretorius starts us off. He said, does there always need to be conflict in a story? Don't we have enough conflict in the world, <clears throat> in the news media, and the social media? <clears throat> Why can't a story just be normal, he said? Or does there need to be fighting scenes? excuse me, so that the story doesn't become boring. And the answer to his question, to your question, Drikas, is that there's a difference between conflict, as in the Ukrainian war or the troubles in Israel, and so on and so on, and literary conflict. There doesn't always have to be the first kind of conflict, physical conflict, war, fisticuffs, in story, unless of course you're writing a thriller or a rollicking adventure where it's appropriate, but there always has to be literary conflict, which is to say a struggle between opposing forces. Now those opposing forces need be no more than a husband and a wife disagreeing about the color of their new curtains, okay? Or the struggle a man, a man might have in bringing himself to commit to marriage, or the different views a man and a woman might have on relationships. I don't know if you remember when Harry met Sally. That was full of literary conflict, but there wasn't a single drop of blood shed. The thing is that without literary conflict, you can't have any drama because everything becomes predictable. People are happy, the children are doing well, the husband has just got a promotion. The wife has just been congratulated on getting her PhD cum laude. The potholes in the road have all been repaired. Load shedding has ended and all is well with the world. Uh, obviously, we would like to live in that world, but it's not the most exciting or dramatic story to read. Okay. And the next question is from Misha Muller. And she asks, how do we break into, oh, she's got a couple of questions. So her first one is, 
how do we break into becoming an author or to get signed at a publishing house as a university student? And my answer to her is write, 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 read, read, read. The truth is you're not going to instantly get signed without having written something substantial that a publisher believes will fit their list of authors and that they believe readers will like. It's unusual, but not impossible to do that at such a young age. But my advice would be not to get hung up on getting signed or finding a publisher. You need to be writing. That's what you must focus on. Don't worry about the publisher at this stage. You need to be writing, writing, honing your craft, getting better, finding joy in the writing and reading, reading. The more you read, the better you'll get. I always think it's a bit like finding a partner in love. You won't find them if you're not out there practicing a bit, kissing frogs. But if you hung up on finding the one instead of just enjoying yourself, if you're not comfortable dating just for you, for the fun of it, it's going to be a struggle for you to find it. Write for yourself. If you're going to be a writer, write for writing's sake. Otherwise, you're going to get all clenched up and you'll be writing what you think everybody else wants of you. And the essence of what makes your writing special will be lost. And besides, in this day and age, there are many different ways to get your writing out there into the world. But now is not the time to worry about that. Focus on your writing and reading first. Then she asks, is it better to choose one genre and one form of creative writing? I would say, what do you enjoy reading? Start with that, with what gives you joy. It's excellent practice to try different forms of writing and different genres. Have fun. Try different things. See what happens that you didn't expect. See what comes out and how successful you were at the different genres you try on a you know small scale, first of all, I would say. But in that sense, creativity is not about rules. Yes, there are conventions of craft, and those are the conventions of craft that we teach that will make your writing better. But there's no genre that's better to choose or a form of writing that you ought to stick to. Writing is good for you. There's more and more research showing that we need to exercise our creativity for our brains and for our mental health. So my advice, actually not just to Misha, but to everybody, is try not to be so goal-oriented while you're writing. It's, it is like finding love. If it happens, that's wonderful. But you're more likely to write something fabulous if you can let go and relax a bit. That does not mean you should write with no regard to elements of story, characters, writing the best possible scene that you can, using details well. Try to write the best way you can but let it be just for yourself, for the joy of expression. Once it's done, you can think further. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck, blocked, and tensed up. Okay, her final question. Is it better to choose creative nonfiction or fiction, or is it better to have a wide variety of content? Well, same answer, really, Misha. Try different things, find what you enjoy and and try to pay attention to what you enjoy reading because you will probably find it easier to write what you enjoy reading. Um, you know, see find what you enjoy and see what comes out. And you I imagine that you're young, you have many years ahead to practice. So try, hone, get better. And even for writers out there who aren't quite so young, I'd say the same. Relax, 
let this be the year of experimentation and practice. See it that way anyway. The whole time I was writing my first book, I told myself it was just practice and that I could delete at any time. And that I told myself, if I didn't like it, I could just start again. So let's enjoy the journey. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay, so Marilyn Keegan's um, asked a couple of questions as, as well. Um, and she said, when you have a full-time job, how easy is it to plan your your writing schedule, your writing discipline? And I guess the answer is that you must decide what's practicable. You can be very ambitious, um, particularly at the beginning of the year. <laughs> okay. Um, I had an academic friend who worked on his PhD every, every day, he reported, uh, for three years from 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. every morning because there was no other time in his day that was available to him before going to university to teach. Um, so you could do that, or you could say, I'm going to put aside an hour every morning, setting the alarm clock an, earl an hour earlier, or I'm going to ring fence a four hour period on Saturdays or Sundays for my writing. Um, Trollope, Anthony Trollope held down a full-time job with the post office, but every day he sat down at his writer's desk for two hours between five o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning, and he managed over his career to write 47 hefty novels. And by hefty, I really mean fat things. So it's possible. Um, it's possible to make it work. Of course, you not only have to set aside the time that you need to write, but you have to make a habit of it. And um, to do that, I'd recommend that you read Atomic Habits by James Clear. He's very good on the sort of techniques you can use to develop good habits and manage your time. And then she switches to a very different question. She says, how do you even manage, how do you even begin to think of a plot? I can write, but plots, and plots are difficult, I agree. But they get easier as you become more experienced at devising them. And the best way to learn how to plot and I'm sorry to bring up commerce so early in the webinar, but is to take our course on the hero's journey. Because the hero's journey is a description of the structure of story that is absolutely second to none in our experience. It's not a recipe. In other words, it's not prescriptive, but it does help enormously in identifying what the essential elements of plot of story are. Let me give you a very brief potted version of structure. You begin with a character who wants something or thanks to something that happens, identifies a burning desire in herself. Your character, for instance, might be a single mother who's managing very well. She has no apparent needs or desire, particular desires, but then her daughter is kidnapped. What she wants now is to rescue her child. And of course, she wants it above everything else in the world. The struggle of your character to get what they want is opposed by an antagonist or various forms of antagonism. The kidnappers want the mother to do something, maybe steal the key to her company's strong room, for instance, before they'll release her daughter. So your character endures a series of tests and trials while she's fighting to get what she wants. She sometimes partially succeeds, but just as often she's disappointed. And the story comes to a climax during which your character endures a terrible ordeal. Perhaps in the case of the little story that we've developed here, she believes that her daughter has died. But then refusing to give up hope, your character fights on and finally beats their antagonist. And in the process, they learn something really important about themselves or the world. And this, with a million variations, 10 million variations, is how story works. So not content with asking how to devise a plot, Marilyn then says, 
what are the most essential elements of building a character? So my favorite story about character building comes from Hilary Mantel. She, she was preparing to write a novel that became the novel The Giant O'Brien, um, based on a real Irish giant of the 18th century who stood eight foot, ten inches tall or something enormous. And she wanted to know more about him. I mean, obviously, she'd done all the research she could, but she wanted. And so she used a practice that she uses for all of her protagonists. She invited them into her study to sit down in front of her and answer questions. Okay, so obviously, all in her imagination. And in her imagination, the giant O'Brien ducked down through the, the door. He had to keep ducking because the ceiling wasn't high enough. And she invited him to sit down in the chair that she'd prepared for him. And he leant down and he pushed down on the seat to test whether it would bear his weight. And she says that that was all she needed to know from him. She had a measure of his character. And so she thanked him and he left. So, okay. Hilary Mantel was an extraordinary writer, and we are not extraordinary writers, or maybe we are. I would say that the most th essential thing to understand about your character is to find out what they want, as Josie said a minute ago. And perhaps just as important, because it can be very different, what they need. And a question that um, Frankie asked, and that will come up a little later, also deals with this distinction between want and need. Your character, I will elaborate then, Frankie, um, your character might want a million dollars, but what they need though is love, right? And that's a story, okay? In building a character, there are three dimensions you have to bear in mind. There are the public aspects of the character, the sorts of things that might appear in their CV, their age, their family circumstances, their schooling, what qualifications they have, what skills they've developed, what job they do. Then there are the private aspects, and these are your character's strengths and weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, the contradictions of their character. Your character might be a successful actor, but in fact, she's very shy, for instance. Uh, my experience of actors is that they're all very shy almost all, and they've masked their shyness by acting. And then there are their secret attributes, and this is my favorite. What are they guilty about? What are their secret desires? Um, what is the contrast between what they seem and who they really are? That makes for story. I don't know if you've seen this new movie. I think it's on Amazon, and it's up for Oscars. Um, Damn, now, of course, the name is, a, as, um, I'll try and think of it. It's all about a character who has secret desires revealed through the course of the story. Okay, then she says, how do you get your work published by a credible vendor? Um, and the answer to that is very simple. You guys might have thought it was a complicated question. I think it's as simple as, 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 sugar. You write a book so good that a publisher can't help but sign a contract with you. That's all it takes. Anyway, look, we've said this before. Josie said it a minute ago. Don't even think about publication until you are quite certain that your book is as good as you can possibly make it. And finally, she says, I want to write a novel, but do not know where to start. Why would anyone be interested in anything that a white 71-year-old South African woman has to say? And I say, if you want to write a novel, but you don't know where to begin, then I say you should join our creative writing course. Um, Joanne has already talked about writing stories that you feel passionate about. So even if you don't take a course, then just get that story, the one you're passionate about, down on paper or your computer. If you tell it well, then people will enjoy reading it. 
and they won't have any reservations about your age, your race, or your nationality. J.M. Kutsir is an 83-year-old white South African man, and that, of course, is a much heavier burden than being a woman, and yet everybody wants to read everything he writes. So, those are my answers to you. And I would just add to that and say, beyond age, gender, all of that, we are human. And we have human concerns. And we have, there are lots of people who are a similar age, juggling issues that are of concern to people in their 70s. Um, and, and you've also got experience of being a younger person. So it doesn't mean you have to write a story about the concerns of a 70 something year old because you've got the advantage of knowing what it's like to be 14, 20, 30, 50, and 70. And, um, you know, we are all, uh, if, we, if we connect with the character, we are interested in their concerns. So I just thought I'd add that. Okay, my next question is from Anita Bateman. And Anita says, I suspect I have the soul of a writer, but I've never written anything yet. Do you have any advice on how to grow into one? So I say, you can feel the creativity bubbling inside you. So practice it, use it, or it'll become harder with time. I didn't start writing for years and years because I was terrified that if I wrote my first line, I'd stare at it and say, oh my God, I've got no talent. What a waste. You know, I, I could have got better and better while I was, you know, if I'd started earlier. And instead of, so instead of focusing on how good you'll be or who will judge you, write for writing's sake. I know I said it. We are approached by so many people in their middle years and beyond who feel that they've suppressed their creativity for so many years in their jobs and their lives generally, doing what other people expect of them. It's never too late. And we've helped many of these people to start and continue writing. But why let go of it in the first place? There are different ways to begin. I always think it's good to, uh, to start with a bit of free writing just to loosen up, you know, loosen those writing sinews. Um, so free writing is when you time yourself, set yourself 10 minutes each day, and just write without thinking, write without considering what you'll be writing about, without worrying about the subject, without worrying about whether, um, you know, you've got, uh, you, whether you're spelling vicissitudes correctly or whether you've got your apostrophe in the right place. Just write and don't pause, don't stop. So just carry on writing until the timer goes at the end of 10 minutes. And it, it, that's not the way to write something seriously, but it does loosen you up. It's actually a very good way to write without self-consciousness in order to grow your writing voice. So you don't ever have to look at it again, throw it away or put it aside and never look at it again. But the practice of doing that will definitely give you ideas and improve your writing. Try using a journal. That's another way to get into it. Write your response to daily life. But my advice would be not to just bang on and on about you, how you feel about things and people. That's all fine and good. But use it to practice active observation. We all think we're observant, but actually we're not as observant as we think we are. And you need to be very observant in order to be a good writer. So, you know, set yourself the task of viewing a scene or a group of people 
and watch them incredibly closely and try to take one step back from um, interpreting them because that's what our brains do every single day. We look at a couple and we think, oh, they're in love. Or we think, oh, he's incredibly angry and controlling. Or we think, oh, what a beautiful, magnificent scene with a majestic mountain. So once you've observed, take that one step back. Don't do the interpreting. Um, try to find the details that m would make your brain think, oh, how majestic, how marvelous, or would make your brain think he's angry and controlling. How does he use his hands? What, you know, how does he stand? What are his gestures like? What does he say and do? Um, and then allow your reader to see that person for themselves and to make that judgment for themselves. In other words, don't tell them to what they should think about the person or the view. And when you're looking at the view, don't use those generic descriptors that are really just, don't tell us about the view at all. All they tell us is about what you thought. Then find those details, find the words that will those specific details, the distinguishing features of a landscape or a person or a group of people, and um, try to find the words to express those to your reader so that your reader will think, oh, oh, that man looks very um, controlling. So that is one of the most important exercises that you can do for your writing, whether you've never written before or whether you're an experienced writer, I believe that we all have to do that, you know, every now and again, no matter how experienced we are as writers, because that is what writing comes down to, finding the details and giving them to the reader so that they can visualize and immerse themselves in the scene. Um, okay, then perhaps try to write a scene about an incident from your own life, a character who is a little bit like you, but not completely, who faces a dilemma in the scene, which is a little bit like a dilemma you faced when you um, went to a dinner party recently or in the workplace, but not quite. You can always change it for dramatic interest. And then at that stage, you know, launch into something bigger. Start thinking about a character, a story, as we've been describing up to now in this webinar. And I would also say, read, 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 read. If you're not reading constantly, you won't grow into a writer. Right. David Milligan asks this question. May I have some guidelines for writing my opening chapter, please? I've written a second draft, which is about the protagonist's mother and father's first meeting. My plan is that other chapters will follow into the protagonist's birth, upbringing, etc., trying to keep the story's tension and dynamic. I'm still wondering if this attempt is the best way, best start to the novel. So, David, you haven't really given us enough information to judge whether this is the best way to open your story. On the face of it, I'd say that it's not the most exciting start. Your protagonist, after all, is the hero of your story. Your protagonist's parents are bit players in his story. So I would begin with him rather than with them. And I would begin with him in action, doing something, something that reveals what sort of person he is and that also helps to kick the story, the plot, if you like, into life. If your story is a memoir, now I know you say it's a novel, but it does sound memoirish then remember that a memoir is not an autobiography. It is not the story of your life. It is the story of an interesting slice of your life. So it's a good idea 
even in memoir, even if this is nonfiction, to start with something dramatic or exciting rather than at the beginning. You can always go back to the beginning later. Um, remember that every story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, uh, whether it's a memoir or not, is a narrative about someone who seeks something. You'll get tired of us beating this drum, but we will go on beating it. Um, stories about people who want something. They might want happiness, they might want wealth or health or love, and either they find it or they don't find it. Um, all stories, now the character arc is about a character who goes from A to B and learns something over the course of that journey. And that is as true of novels as it is of memoirs. So um, I hope that gives you some glimmers of advice that you can use for your opening chapter. But as I say, um, without seeing it in more detail, um, it's difficult to give you more specific advice. Josie? Okay. So, Natasha Paulser asks, how do I build my character profiles to create interesting characters for my story? There are so many different ways to do this, and different writers have different methods. But the point of it all is to create a character who is larger than the confines of your plot. The character must step off the page and have complex aspects that make your readers feel they're getting to know a real person. You know that I'm sure you must have read books in your life that you just fell in love with the characters, that you that you felt like they were your friends and that... You, you know, when the book ended, you felt like you were saying goodbye to a friend. And that's what you want. So I go further than simply listing a few characteristics. Find a way to climb inside um, this person and discover what makes them tick. Walk around in their skin for a while. Um, daydream them. Uh, you know, I read an article the other day which said that uh, daydreaming, they've been doing research, more research on the brain. And people who daydream are, are able to be more creative and or also have better memories. Those of you who like, uh, like me, who are worried about um, forgetting names and, and, uh, and words. Um, I've been a daydreamer my whole life. But, uh, and I was always told, stop doing that, it's a waste of time. Well, it's not a waste of time. And, you know, um, yes, there are, uh, you know, many methods of building character, but one of them is to daydream the character, slip inside their skin, live in their skin for a day or two, create scenarios in w uh, of which they are part, and you consider how you would react, how you would feel, how you would deal with a certain situation as that character. And that will allow you to, you know, feel what it's like to be them. And um, ask them questions. What do they like, like Hilary Mantel does? What do they like? What do they dislike? What do they fear? What secret do they hold close? Think about what might have happened to them in their life, good or bad, before the start of your story that might have affected the person they are. This won't appear in the story you tell, but it will help to create um, a full and rounded character because you know for yourself that things that have happened to you, good and bad, a success that you had in life, a loss, that you might have experienced early in life, created, changed you, and helped create the person that you are today. So give some thought to those things. Um, and then it depends what is necessary. If the character is more similar to yourself, 
you can use yourself as a template and change change yourself slightly for the character. But for one of my books, I needed to find uh, more about um, the field that my character had entered because it wasn't something I had a lot of experience of. My character had uh, studied to, to be a priest. Um, and I, need, I needed to get a feel for his influences, what it made him into the person he is. So I found I needed to read some of the books that would have been seminal reading matter for him to get a feel for him and what had, you know, developed his views and his feelings on certain things. I also find it useful to talk to people who are similar to your character, to form an impression on them, to find out more about what makes them tick. Um, we can also, as we've said, we can also help with this, either through our mentoring program, where we hold your hand through the writing process, which includes the character development stage, or our creative writing course, which teaches you the skills that you can carry forward into your own writing. Okay. Natasha also asked, how do I start getting the ideas I, I have and actually developing them further? So again, yes, we can help with this. Book a brainstorm with us and we can help you to develop your ideas and, and actually create um, a story by that very creative process of brainstorming, which will be your story but, uh, you know, we will have thrown the ideas around um, in order to help you develop it. But the way to start is with character. What is your, we've said this, what does your character want badly? Um, so as Richard said, this can be an existing desire or something that's triggered by an event. What prevents them from getting what they want? What do they do in response? And what happens next, which raises the stakes and the tension and makes what they want even more unattainable. Keep asking yourself, what if, what if? But basically, that is how you build story. And as Tony, Robin, uh, Tony Morrison said, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. So think, yes, think about the kind of, of books that you like to read and the kind of book that you would like to, to read. And uh, if it's not out there, then yes, that's your story. Go and write it. All right. So she, the last question she asks is, how do I develop plot twists? I feel like sometimes stories can be so predictable. And I would say, don't be too mechanistic. It's about the character. Surprise us, lead us to think your character will do and say something, and then they don't. Think in terms of character rather than plot. If we care about your character and what they're going through, we'll have our, our, you know, our hearts in our, in, in our mouths, wondering what will become of them. We won't be worrying about whether any other character somewhere in the world has experienced something similar. The range of human experience might be limited in that we all lose people in different ways. We have children or don't have children and want them or don't have children and don't want them. We fall in love or we don't and hope to, etc. It's probably not possible to devise for your character incidents or encounters that no one has ever gone through before, unless they're abducted by aliens. And even there, there are people who claim that it's happened to them. And yet each person's experience of that incident and the way they respond to it is different. So don't try to worry and think forefront too much about plot twists. Focus on your character, what they want, what stands in their way, and what, ha what happens that makes what they want 
seem more and more unattainable. Keep the tension high. If we care about your character, we'll care about what they're facing, I promise you. Okay. Right, Heather Joyce um, tells the story of a jazz pianist that she's worked through, worked with, um, a jazz pianist whose um, commitment was to extremely esoteric jazz. Um, he never took any care to appeal to a wide audience. And she wondered whether um, <clears throat> she tried to persuade him to, to become more accessible and he refused. So how do we apply this to writing? Um, and I begin by telling you what my mother said about love. My mother used to say, don't marry for money, but love where money is. Okay, so I think the same thing, um, <clears throat> the same approach is forgivable in writers. We don't write, we don't advise you to write in order to make money or to gain recognition or to get onto the bestseller lists. But when you're planning your story and writing it, I think that you should keep an eye on what is published and what does find favor with readers. You must obviously write the story you really want to write because you won't succeed if you write something simply to order. Well, I've got something to say about that in a minute. Um, so you, you must write what you want to write, but how you write it will depend upon your attitude to your reader. If your name happened to be James Joyce, and if you're happy to live in penury or on the charity of patrons, if you can find them, then I think you have every right to be as experimental